was asking the Lord today, what do you have to say to the ramp? I literally was just saying that out loud. What do you have to say to the ramp? I was just listening, and as I listened, what came to me was what I've already said to the ramp. It's what I might have heard. And then I began to think about, okay, what was the last thing I've heard you say? Now, he's been saying a lot because he talks a lot. And if you've got an ear to hear him, you'll hear him a lot. But the last, one of the last things that I've heard God say to me, and see, I just want to look at it like this. If he's saying it to me, he's saying it to the ramp. So whatever words I hear, I just go ahead and say it's your word too. Are you willing to take that? So I just, whenever he said, it's, what, what, am I, what am I saying? I'm saying what I've said. In other words, sometimes God's not going to give you a new word until you've acted on and fulfilled the last word. So I just sort of went back today and began to, to remember the last word. One of, one of the most recent words that I've heard that really shook me, and you, I've told you before, but he brought it back again today, was this word. What I've told you to do, do it now. Now, if you recall that story that happened to me back in the spring of this year, I'd gotten up. I'm going to re rehash it for those of you who have not heard it. I was sound asleep. I'd gotten up early for the morning. I had literally taken probably about two steps from the bed, and I literally heard a voice. Now, for me, it was as though the voice was audible, even though it was in my spirit. But when you're hearing, sometimes that voice, especially if it's a serious word, it will sound as though it's almost audible. And so for me, it sounded that way. So I'd taken about two steps and I heard the Lord say, what I've told you to do, do it now. And it shook me because he sounded serious when he said it. And it literally jolted me. I didn't even tell Rick about it. In fact, I left that morning. I'd come here for morning prayer at the ramp at 8. And, and Kevin and Pam were in the foyer in the green room and, and uh, Winfred and Lee. And they were standing in the green room. And so they were at the door. And when I walked in the door, I just started telling them, I've got to tell you all about this word I just heard. And I said, this is what really, he, you know, stirred me this morning. What I've told you to do, do it now. And so I pondered it. I literally began to think, Lord, am I about to die? <laughs> then... A few days later, I get a text from a pastor in Birmingham area who's the pastor of a Southern Baptist church. He hardly, I hardly ever hear from this man. He is spirit-filled and very prophetic. He has given me, when Lindsay was gone especially, he sent me a prophetic word that blew me away and came to pass. All right? There's a couple things in it that's yet to come to pass. It's going to be glorious. But he's he's always right on. Well, I, I might hear from him once a year, maybe once every two years, okay? So after I told Kevin and Pam and all that, a couple of days later, I get a text, and it's from him. I see his name on my phone. I go, ooh, uh, Pastor Richard. So I tapped it and looked, and here's all it said. He's always a man of, to the point. He said, saw your face this morning in prayer. The Lord said to tell you what I have told you to do do it now. Time is of the essence. In the last week of this week, I didn't even think about this until today because this word began to, 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 to move again in my spirit. And so I began to think and realize this week, now this is interesting. Um, I haven't been, y'all know me, I love yard sales. In thrift stores and auctions and estate sales. That's just my, it's a hobby. I don't get to do very much. Haven't been probably in a year or two much, hardly at all. Mom and I enjoy going. But this week I got to go to two, an estate sale and an auction. And so it was just fun. It, I just go for fun. It's, it's hilarious. I usually go and laugh and laugh with my mom and sister. But this week I went to one, and I didn't even think about it, but I bought a clock at the estate sale. I bought a clock at the auction, and this weekend in Birmingham, I preached for the Church of God camp meeting, women's meeting, and uh, on Thursday, and a woman, I don't know who she was, came up to Abigail and told Abigail to give me this gift. It's a necklace with a watch, clock, on the end of it. That's why I wore it tonight. Wearing this for a reason. And if I could, 
If you want to know what I'm really feeling it's doing, I wish I could press a button and it go, we're just an alarm. It's a really bad alarm, wasn't it? But anyway, I wish it would, I wish it would just, <laughs> I wish it would just ring like an alarm. Because that's what I feel like it's doing. I feel like it's just ringing. Like the alarm's going off. Why would God give me two clocks and a watch in a week? Unless he is trying to say, time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. So, we're going to step into this just a little bit tonight. So I began to think, okay, knowing what you said, what I've told you to do, do it now. Time is of the essence. What I've told you to do. So lately, even today, I've been going, revisiting that going, God, what have you told me to do? So I just began to think about it in very simple terms. That's usually the way he, you'll find him is in the simple places. What have you told me to do? I'll tell you what he's told the ramp to do. He's told the ramp to bring people into the presence of God to be awake, awakened, equipped, and sent out. That's what he's told the ramp to do. Listen to me good. What has he told us to do? He has told us to bring people any age, but especially young people, into the presence of God, to be awakened to the real God, equipped in the word, RSM, and sent out to change the world to the harvest field. In other words, it's to awaken a generation. To a, what has he called us to do? What I've told you to do. Do it now. What is that? It's, he's called us to awaken a generation that's just huge out of spiritual death and religious complacency, calling them into their individual purpose and their corporate responsibility as an offensive army imposing the kingdom of God. So that's what he's called us to do. That's number one thing. Second thing, I only wrote down two. This one has come to me, especially more in the last two or three years, as a very specific assignment. And that is to raise up an army of intercessors that will pray in laborers for the harvest. That's, that is being manifested. Now, that's also, we do that even in our conferences for the young people. But I especially feel it right now as an assignment with women in particular, not leaving out the men, they're intercessors too, but I do feel a specific call. That's why I have my front porch fringe every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. And I heard I've got two front porch friends here tonight. Right, Pam? What are their names? Eileen and Terry, where are you in this room, Eileen and Terry? Would you just let me see you? I'll give you a hug later on. Welcome, my front porch friends, Eileen and Terry. <laughs> Pam, Pam, it's so funny because these front porch friends of mine, I feel like I know them all. It's the truth. There's, God has just put a connection in us, in our spirit. But the, the assignment for my front porch friends, it is to awaken women especially women and men too. I got a rebuke the other day from a man in my comments saying, what, are you, what is this? Are you just only going to talk to women? I mean, he said, I'm, I'd like to pray too, you know. <laughs> but it is to awaken them to their role, to their importance, to their value in these last days to be awakened as watchmen and to stand their ground that God has given them. And if think about this. When I looked at the women's conference we did in April, and I'm looking at uh, 1,500 women that had come to Cleveland for the really Front Porch Friends Conference, I'm looking at these 1,500 women thinking, this represents tens of thousands of people in here. Because if you get 1,500 women praying for their husbands and their children and their grandchildren and their cities, look how that multiplies because God will answer their prayers. I'm telling you, it is a true formula for revival. Even in this room today, if every single one of you without age limit, and who cares, male or female, whatever, you just stand your ground as a watchman and an intercessor. Look at the harvest that would be represented right here. So that's what God's called us to do. 
what I've told you to do, do it now. So those are the two things we're emphasizing because it's harvest time. Jesus said, I want you to look at this scripture in John 4, chapter 4 and 34, verse 34. It's very fascinating because Jesus has just encountered the woman at the well. And his disciples, you know, are a little confused. He's revealed himself as Messiah. They don't even understand that. And verse 34, well, let me scoot up to verse uh, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you don't know about. Then one of the disciples said, did somebody bring him food while we were gone? And then Jesus exclaimed, please listen to this. Then Jesus said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. I'm just going to stop there for one second. I just got to say this. I love that about Jesus. We've got to get that mindset in us that he said to these disciples, did did somebody bring him some food? And he goes, no, no, no. I'm not not talking about natural food. He said, my nourishment. Watch this. Jesus said, my life, what I live for, comes from doing the will of my Father who sent me, watch, and finishing his work. He said, you know what, boys? That means more to me than food. That means more to me than anything on this earth. Jesus was saying, I live to fulfill the will of my Father. Then he starts talking about the will of his Father. Listen to what he says. In verse 33, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say to you, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Then I love this, watch. The harvesters are paid good wages. Please listen. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. In other words, the harvest field he's talking about, these fields are white and they're ready to harvest. What kind of a harvest is it? He said it's people. It's being brought to eternal life. Then he said what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. He said, you know the saying, one plants and another harvest. He said, and it's true. He said, but I've sent you to harvest ramp where you didn't even plant. Others had already done the work, and you're just getting to gather the harvest. Oh, my, 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 ramp. God is saying here, ramp, I'm giving you an opportunity to just gather a harvest. I'm I'm, I'm doing things for you that's... that that other people have already gone before you and paved the way, and you're going to get to reap from it. We've we've been talking about that for a while here. Pastor Mike was preaching on it. Brian was preaching on it a while back. What does that mean? It means it's generational ministry. I'm I'm, I'm literally reaping ministry, and I don't know how far it goes back because I only know my great-great-grandmother who was filled with the Holy Ghost. Then my great-grandmother, Grandma Lolly, filled with the Holy Ghost, full of faith. My grandmother... Mother showed me this week, we were driving, me and my mom, I preached last Sunday at the Rocky Top Free Will Baptist Church. Anybody just say thank you, Lord, for that awesome opportunity. I was preaching there in Hamilton last Sunday morning. And on the way, because you go way out in the country, and on the way out there, we passed this cinder block building. I didn't even know this because it was way out in Hodges, toward, well, toward Hodges. And Mother said, see that little building right there? She said, many years ago when I was a teenager, she said, me and my mother started a church of God of prophecy in that building. What in the world? Long before the building I went to was here, mother was just a teenager. What was she doing? What was my grandmother doing? What was my great-grandmother doing? And my great-grandmother, they were planting. They were planting. They were planting. They didn't know that they were going to have a great granddaughter someday that was going to come into Hamilton and start harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. I believe right now, even in Cleveland, Tennessee, with that dream that God gave us. Why in the world are we in Cleveland, Tennessee? Because God gave us a dream through Chase, the prophet dreamer here, that there was three wells, two still covered up. We don't know where those are, but we wonder about that, Chase. But the third well in the dream, I love this, was uncovered. 
And that well, the water was filled to the brim and the water was boiling. And Samuel Bentley looked at Chase and he said, this well is Miss Karen's spiritual heritage. And when he said that, the well began to shoot up like a geyser. I believe that's Cleveland, Tennessee. I believe we're going to see a harvest of souls in Cleveland, Tennessee. Come on. And what kind of, what, where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. Many generations back, we were going to Cleveland, Tennessee to the General Assembly. My people were there. Those old saints praying and sowing in the ground of Cleveland, Tennessee for the church of God, and the church of God of prophecy. Well, I've got seed in that ground because my, grand, my, my grandmothers and my ancestors planted that seed in the ground. So God says, now you've got a spiritual heritage there as the ramp and the water's already filled and boiling and it's ready to shoot up like a geyser. Come on. That's why we're in Cleveland. Why are we in Manchester, England? I'd love to know. But I have been studying this and I found out that the Palmers, my people, my mother's maiden name was Palmer and all of my people have come from England. The vast majority of the Palmers are from England. So now then I'm just wondering what ancestor did I have that I don't know about, probably won't ever know in this life, was planting some seed in Manchester, England and didn't know that their great, 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 great granddaughter someday was going to hear the word of the Lord and say, go harvest that seed that your great, 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 great ancestor put in the ground. Come on, that's what God's saying. Oh, he's got some fields for you to harvest. He's got some plant. He's got some places for you to go to that you don't even know about yet. If you'll be faithful in the field he's given you right now, he's going to give you fields you know not of. I love that. You don't even know yet where God's going to call you. You don't even have a clue yet. When I was 18, when I was 20, I never dreamed of anything like this. When I was 35 and 40, you wouldn't have even... Well, I was 40 when he called me here. But when I was 35, I'd have been blown over with a feather if you'd have said... In about three more years, you're going to quit what you're doing now almost, and you're going to start working with teenagers. What? And the Lord's going to call you to Manchester, England. He's going, what? You don't have, you don't even know. About the time you think you're about ready to retire, God says, I got something up my sleeve for you. That's right, doctor. He does. He says here, oh, that what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester. Oh, I believe in heaven. There's joy while they're seeing us reaping their seed. He says one plant. He said, I've sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Now look at, now look at Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 35. You ready? Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. Verse 36, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. When he saw the what? Y'all help me. He had compassion on them because they were confused, and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Does our world today look like that when you turn on the news and you look at this generation? What do I see when I look at this generation? I see a bunch of teenagers and old folks too, for that matter, confused and helpless, wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his who? Yeah, y'all talk to me. He said to who? He said to them, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the harvest. Now look, let's look at me and listen. The harvest ramp is great, but the laborers are few. Now then here's the deal. The world has always been ready to harvest. When Jesus said that verse, that was 2,000 years ago, watch. And every generation since he said those words, that verse has been true for them. Every generation that's ever lived, that ever listened to the words of Jesus or read them in, on the pages, for every one of them, that was true for their generation. The world has always been ready to harvest. But the laborers have been few. That's why Keith Green says, this generation of Christians in 2021 
is responsible for this generation of souls in 2021. The Christians in 1812 were responsible for the lost souls of 1812. I don't know how well they did, but I know even as a generation they'll stand before God for how well they did with the generation that they were responsible for. Are you listening to me? This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of lost souls. You could look at that and say, well, it's just too big a job. Then you don't know how big God is. It would be too big a job if we had to do it in the flesh. But when he's with us, come on, then there's nothing too hard for God. And it's his will to harvest it. So we say it can be done. The harvest is great, Jesus said. I want y'all to look at what he said. He said the harvest The harvest is great. In other words, it's a massive job. This harvest, it's abundant. And Jesus said over there in the other verse, what is the harvest? The souls, the people. This job is huge. It's bigger than you think and realize. And then basically he's saying, especially to us, and in these verses, you need to hurry. In the other verses, he was saying, y'all say it's four months between planting and harvest. He's saying, but I'm not saying that. I'm telling you, wake up right now and lift up your eyes because the fields are ready right now. In other words, he said, I'm able to do a supernatural work between planting and harvest if I can just get some laborers to lift up their eyes and see and stop waiting and stop making excuses. In the natural realm, you've got a window of time to harvest in. If you're planting crops out here in these fields in the natural, you've only got a window of time to get the harvest in. Because if you miss your window of time for the harvest, the whole harvest will be lost. And in the natural, you can try again next year. But in the spiritual, we have a window of time, come on, to harvest these fields for our generation. We've just got a little window of time to get the harvest in. But for us, it's not like a natural harvest. Because in the natural harvest, they lose, they can try again. In the spiritual harvest, if we lose this generation and this harvest, They've lost, been lost for eternity, and there's no second chance. Come on, let that weigh on you. That's why we got to do it now. That's why God said, what I've called you to do, Ramp, do it now. Time is of the essence. What I've called you to do, Ramp, do it now. Time is of the essence. Come on, can you hear that tonight? Come on, can you see it? What I've called you to do, do it now. Look at this harvest field. Look around. In your mind, see downtown New York City at at the busiest time of the day. Look around. In your mind, visualize China and the streets of China. In your mind, just visualize Japan, those pictures and video of how busy those streets are. Almost none of them know Jesus. The fields are white. It just looks almost impossible. How are we going to reach these people? For that matter, look at Hamilton. Just little Hamilton. Say, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? It just feels like it's bigger than we are. It feels like it's impossible. What, 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 what? See, here's the problem with this picture we're viewing. Jesus said, harvest is great. The laborers are few. That's the problem he presents. Great harvest. Few laborers. And here's another little problem. Here's the, let me, this is a little sidetrack here. Here's how foolish sometimes we are on the field with what laborers we do have. We act as though we're jealous 
that there's other laborers out there besides us. We act as though, what are y'all doing out here? You know? If we start hearing that God's blessing their work and their harvest, they're harvesting more than we are. They're in revival. We had the promise for revival. Well, they've got a, they've got a better worship team. than They're over there worshiping the harvest field, and they're better than we are. We act jealous of the other laborers. Like we think that we can harvest this vast global field all by ourselves. One church acting jealous of another church. One church acting like, well, they don't, you know, we don't want them to be do too well because we got to do better than they have because we got to, we got to be the cutting thing. We got to be the number one. We got to be the main thing. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The thing is, we can't do this by ourselves. No church can, no ministry can, no denomination can. This harvest field is so vast. Honey, we, just think about just Hamilton, for example. The ramp holds about 1,000. We're getting ready to build an auditorium to hold 2,000. That's about all we can get in that room across the street. It's 2,000. We're going to double. Hallelujah. And that's good. Hamilton has 7,000. Marion County has 30,000. 30,000 within a 20-minute radius of where we are. 30,000 within Marion County, right? 30-minute radius within us right here. 30,000 30, people. Honey, we need to rejoice for every church building we've possibly got in this city. We need everybody in this county. We need everybody on fire. We need every church in revival. Can you see that? We need everybody we can possibly get to help us just harvest Marion County. Oh, God help us all. In Mark 11, in Mark 9, 38, the disciples one time told Jesus, they said, Lord, we saw somebody over here casting out a devil. And so we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. <laughs> so I'm quoting the Bible. And Jesus looked back then and he said, don't stop them. He said, if he's not against us, they're for us. And then Jesus, see, well, you think of it this way. In the natural realm, just to harvest a natural field, it takes all kinds of watch, tools, machinery, it takes all kinds of barns and silos, right? Are y'all still with me? In the, natural, in the natural realm, it takes everything, all kinds of tools and, and machines. Well, in the spiritual harvest, the fields that we're in, we need all kinds of tools out here. We need all kinds, those tools that are different spiritual gifts, honey, we need them all. We need all kinds of machinery, which means ministries. We need all kinds of ramps in all different flavors. I don't care what, Corey, we need you to do impact. We need everybody. To, we need Perry Stone to do Warrior Fest. Come on, we need Jensen Franklin to do what? Come on, we need them all. We need them all. We need every ministry we can get. We need every barn we can get. We need every silo. Barns to me would represent churches. We need more barns. We need more silos. We need everybody. All hands on deck. Everybody fully engaged. It's harvest time. We've got to do this. So what do we do? What do we do about this vast harvest? We have a field that's ready to harvest and a few laborers. Well, Jesus told us, the, he told us the vision, he told us the problem, and he gave us the solution. He said, here, here's what you do. What are you going to do about your problem? Vast field and few laborers? Pray. Pray. He said, what I need you to do. He was on the earth now when he said this. He said, honey, here's what you got. You've got to pray to the Lord of the heart. That he will send forth laborers into the harvest field. That's amazing to me. Because it goes again to prove what John Wesley said is true. God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. In other words, that's so amazing. Because you would look at that and think, well, God, these are souls. You'd want people to be saved, wouldn't you? I mean, obviously you would. He doesn't just automatically send the laborers. You know why? He requires people to pray. Watch. It takes praying that God to send forth laborers into the field. 
Why does God require that? Because I believe God's saying, I'm not going to let you do this without me. Why does he do that? Because the flesh will profit nothing, but the spirit will give life. Why does he require you to pray for laborers? Because he says your work in the flesh will profit nothing, and then in turn it will still, it'll destroy you. If you get out here and start trying to labor in the flesh, it'll profit nothing, and in the end it will destroy you. I've got to know that even in this, you're living utterly dependent on me. Come on, in other words, you can't do this without me. Pray for laborers. And then look, what do you do after that? Get ready for him to answer. Oh, why do I know that? He'll answer this prayer quick. Why do I know that? Because he's about time and he knows it's urgent. And this is his will for it to happen. And if it's his will, you can have whatever you're asking for. So if you're asking for laborers, what's going to happen? He's going to start sending laborers. He's going to start waking people up. And I tell you this, he'll probably start with you. Because in right the very next verse, in the very next verse, in Matthew 10, right after Jesus says, pray the Lord the harvest sent forth laborers, look at chapter 10, very next verse. So Jesus called his disciples together. The same ones, say I'm listening. The same people he had just told to pray for laborers are the same people now he calls. Come over here. All right. <laughs> that was a quick prayer, wasn't it? Now then, I'll take you. You prayed quick, then I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you power to cast out devils. I'm reading. He gave them authority to cast out devils and to heal every kind of sickness and disease. Then he tells their names. Come on. I believe your name can be listed down there too. Then in verse 5, Jesus sent out the 12 disciples with these instructions. Can you hear that? Jesus sent out those 12 disciples that he had just told to pray. And this is interesting. The word sent out. Whenever it says here, pray the Lord of this harvest, that he would send forth laborers. Did you know, and we're familiar with this at the ramp, thanks to Lou Engel, that the word Jesus uses right there in Greek, he used a Greek word Jesus did, and that Greek word was ekbalo. Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will ekbalo laborers into the field. Now, what does ekbalo mean? Glad you asked, because I looked it up today. Here's what ekbalo, think of all the words he could have used. He could have said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will ask laborers to go to the field. He could have said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would suggest that laborers would go if they are able he didn't say that. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest will ekbalo them. Ekbalo means to violently eject, to thrust out. Ekbalo means to throw something. It means to cast out. It means to drive out. In fact, the other places in the New Testament they used the word ekbalo was when Jesus was casting out devils. It said he would ekbalo those devils. He would cast them out violently. When Jesus cast out devils, he wouldn't nice to them and ask them to go out if they wanted to. He cast them out. That's what Jesus is saying here. Ask the Father if he would ekbalo people into the field. I read this today. It was so strong. It says these, these were three of the definitions of ekbalo. Listen to this. It means with notion of violence. In other words, he's going to be violent about it. He has to be. It means to compel someone to depart in stern language. Listen to this. It means to command or cause someone to depart in haste. Command them to go in haste. Listen to this one. I, this one is wild. It means to lead one forth or away somewhere with a force that cannot be resisted. Jesus said pray that God will send people out with a force that they can't resist. Wow. In this case, it implies urgent, interruptive action. 
the abundance and the urgency of the harvest necessitates pulling laborers away from their current occupations to employ them here in the field instead. By nature, it means that this is a disruptive call. It means we cannot go on living business as usual. Are y'all awake? I need to know it. Come on. Ramp, are you here? I said it means we cannot go on living business as usual. We must pray, send out laborers, and then we must be ready to go when he calls. After he said pray for the laborers to be sent, he sent them. Look at Matthew. I'm almost done. I'm heading to the end. Look at Matthew 10. Look at this. In Matthew 10, where Jesus calls the disciples, this is huge for us, Ramp. I'm going to read this to you. Look. When Jesus called the disciples, right after he said pray, and he sent them, verse 5, and Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Listen carefully. He told the 12 disciples, don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Now, did God care about Gentiles? Did he care about Samaritans? Of course. But it wasn't time right right then. So you've got to be led by the Spirit for wherever God's sending you. You don't just go randomly. You've got, that's why he says, you've got to pray for laborers. And then after you're sent out, you've got to pray for every step of the way. You don't just go any, many, 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 I like that city because they've got a good beach. You'll get eaten alive. If you go into a city or a nation that you've not been sent to, you'll be opened up to the demonic forces of that region. Come on, they can wipe you out. But when you go led by the Spirit of God, there's no devil in hell that can overpower you. Come on, when you go in the authority of the Spirit of God, oh, come on, you have all of heaven backing you up. So he tells them, you've got to go only where I tell you to go. And right now, You don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Right now, boys, you're only going to the lost sheep of Israel. He said, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. He's telling them where to go, who to go to, and here's what you preach. He's going to tell you every step of the way. He's going to tell you where to go and what to say. Go tell them the kingdom of heaven is here. Heal the sick and raise the, heal the sick and cure the lepers and cast out devils. Freely you have received. So God is giving them a very specific mission. He has given the ramp a very specific mission. It's not always been understood by many people, including me and Rick. (laughs) Sometimes we always wonder, now, Lord, what is this? What are we doing? But he keeps us in the ramp. And sometimes people, because it's different, they want to try to make it fit in what they're, what's normal to them. And, well, the ramp, where do you put the ramp? Well, what is it? And, and how does it fit? And how does it fit in the body? And, you know, some people just make, make, want to make it a wart on the body or something weird. You know, they love, well, where does the ramp fit in? What is that? Well, here's the deal. The ramp has a very specific assignment. It's very clear to us. It really is. We are called to do what I said a while ago. We're called to awaken a generation. I'm called to go out here and get these kids. I'm called to go out there and find these kids and bring them in this room in the presence of God from churches all over the place, all kinds of denominations. We're called to bring them in from all over cities, all over the nation, the whole nation. Come on. It, that, I know it doesn't look like a normal, typical local church job, but that's not, it's not that we're any better than a normal local church. Not a bit. Just different. That, normal, that local church is just as needed as we are, just as important as we are. Come on. We're all needed. That's what I'm telling you. It's going to take all machinery, everybody doing their part. You just got to know what you're assigned to do. And don't be worried about it if it looks a little different than everybody else's. The thing is, the ramp's mission is clear. And I, I heard, I saw this the other day. My cousin was telling me about this. He goes to a Baptist church in Florence, and I love this Baptist church. It's powerful. And that pastor's a little different there. 
And uh, he was telling my cousin, you know, people come in there and they, because it's not a typical Baptist church, uh, but he's called to do something a little different. And God's using him mightily. And he hung a sign up in his foyer. Don't be surprised if you walk in the ramp foyer someday and this is hanging out there. He hung a picture in the foyer that said, our mission is specific and non-negotiable. We know what we're called to do. Ramp, we know what we're called to do. We're called to go out there and get lost people and lost kids and bring them in this place and make sure that the ramp stays a place that the fire of God is burning in this room. And how are we going to make sure it's burning in this room? It's got to burn inside of every one of us. Come on. It's not just a building. It's not the bu- This building ain't going to change nobody. There's got to be a people that keeps the fire burning in their soul that live in the presence of God that make it the priority of their life. And when they live that way, when people walk in their presence, they'll feel the presence of the one they live for. That's what we're called to do. It's specific. Presence is everything to us. It's our assignment. Whenever I was, I went to, lately I've been going on Sunday morning to some of these local Baptist churches around here. I went to New Hope Baptist Church the other Sunday morning since we don't have Sunday morning churches, services. I can go to Sunday morning to other churches. Mom went to Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church this morning. I went to New Hope, then I went to preach at Rocky Top, praise God. Free Will Baptist. Glory to God. Then they used the rock hole that I, they had the largest crowd they'd ever had that Sunday morning. Last Sunday. It's about 45. And then after the service was over, they did a baptism in the rock hole. They baptized 12 people. They were so excited. Come on. I went to New Hope Baptist Church the other day, and there was about 10 people there. And it changed my life. I left that church. Pastored. New Hope is out in the woods past my house, way past my house. I go to that Baptist church. There was about five people when I first got there. And I was shocked because I thought the Lord told me to go, so I went. And I got there, and the, and the pastor is 19 years old. 19 years old. Then there was one other girl there out of the, the five when I got there that looked like she was about 19-ish who played the piano. And the rest of the people were elderly. And that 19-year-old boy loved those people. And he won my heart. And they sang for their worship service two songs. Swing wide the gates, I'm coming home. Swing wide the gates, it won't be long. And so they sang these songs. And I left that church with my heart full. And I'll tell you something else. Not only did they sing these songs, but when that 19-year-old boy was preaching, in the middle of his sermon, Holy Ghost. I just felt him. I just felt the anointing of the Lord. Oh, and I just thought, well, there you are, Holy Ghost. Look at you. You're right here in this room with these nine to ten people. You're always looking for a way to get in, aren't you? Look at this. I walked out of that New Hope Baptist Church. You know what I knew? Nothing about them needs to change. That boy needs to stay right here in this harvest field and speak their language and minister to these people because their assignment's different from the ramps. But, boy, we need them. Come on. Because the ramp wouldn't be able to really reach those people the way that boy's reaching those people. And we need that 19-year-old boy down there loving those people. Come on. Loving them right into heaven. we got to have everybody doing what they're called to do because we need them all. We need them all. We need them all. I know I'm going a long time tonight, but I don't get to preach here much, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it. Hallelujah. So just bear with me. And if you've got to go, I understand. I'll maybe forgive you after a sozo. Watch. I'm almost through. But listen, he tells them first, here's where you go. Here's what you say. Now look at verse 9 of chapter 10 of Matthew. Don't take any money to your money belts. In your money bills, don't take gold or silver or copper coins when I send you out. Don't carry a suitcase, a traveler's bag, or a change. Don't even take a change of clothes. 
and don't even take sandals or a walking stick. Now, later on, he told them they could take a walking stick, but don't take anything else. Isn't that amazing? He said, don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Now, I'm going to make this one quick. Listen, Jesus said here to them, here's, your, 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 your assignment is specific. Now, here's what I need you to do. This I'm going to teach you ministry right here, boys. He said, I'm going to teach you one thing about ministry because all of you in this room is called a ministry, every one of you. I don't, that doesn't mean you've got to preach from a pulpit. It means in your office, in your school, in your plant, wherever you're working, that's your mission field. But here's what he said. You've got to learn to live utterly dependent upon God. Don't ever think you can, you can figure this out. Don't depend on your flesh. Don't try to figure this thing out. You've got, that's what he was teaching them right there. I'm going to teach you to live utterly dependent upon God. I could go there, but I'm not for right now. The last thing he said that I'm going to touch on tonight is verse 11. And whenever you enter a city or a village, search for a, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. Now, I'm not going to go into that tonight, but I could, but we'll do it another day. What does he mean by that? I, you know, I've run into some people lately that we'll talk about when we're not on the Internet, but they are amazing people in ministry. And they have taught about how to evangelize in a way that's life transforming and it's changing a nation right now, okay? Trust me. I'll talk about that on another night when we're just us and we can. But here's how they interpret that verse about find a person like a person of peace. This was fascinating. He said, you in a city, wherever God's sending you, number one, they say, that you go and you saturate that place in prayer before you ever even speak to anybody about Jesus. Don't just haphazardly go in trying to witness, okay? You saturate a place in prayer. Pray for the hearts to be prepared. See, that's, again, depending on God, utterly dependent upon God. Can't do this without you. Now, you got to go before me and prepare the way. Then what you do is you start looking in your plant, in your office, in your school. If you go to Walmart, wherever you go, what do you do? You start looking for a person of peace. What does that mean? Start looking for a person that there's peace with talking to them. There's an open door. You can tell. You can tell when somebody's open. This week with Abigail and Abigail. <laughs> Abigail and Abigail went with me to Georgia. We went to a restaurant, an Italian restaurant in Atlanta. And uh, we were, I said, just Google and find a good one. So Abigail found one, I forgot, that Pasta Bella or something like that. And so I was like, well, that sounds good. Read the review. And they were good enough to go. So I said, let's go to Pasta Bella. So we go to Pasta Bella, and we're sitting in there. It was kind of a different place. It wasn't a place I've ever been to, a family-owned restaurant. We passed all these other kinds of good restaurants. But we just thought, let's go to Pasta Bella. We go there. didn't take long to know why God sent us to Pasta Bella. He sent us there for Ricardo. Because this young man comes up to the table. He's the manager of the restaurant. But is it not true, girls? Instantly, I could see the door open. He didn't, all he said was something silly like, he looked at me and said, you're a troublemaker. <laughs> I thought, well, the devil's talking right there. He can cast that thing out because I am a troublemaker to the devil. You're right. You better believe I am. I am your troublemaker. That's right. But I ain't going after that devil. I'm going after that boy that just said that to me. That's all I needed to hear him just say that to me. I thought, there's my boy right there. So he says, you're a troublemaker. I said, oh, no. I said, I'm your blessing. Well, that had caught his attention. So next thing you know, Ricardo keeps coming back to our table. And I say, are you the manager? He starts asking questions and more questions that lead to me, leads me eventually to be able to just start throwing some seed. Just throw in some seed in Ricardo's heart. And Ricardo's heart was wide open because the fields are white and ready. And Ricardo was ready. Come on. He was ready. And I said to him, I can't remember what I said now. The Holy Ghost was just saying something to him. And Ricardo's eyes looked at me kind of funny. And he goes, ooh. He said, I felt that. Yeah. He said, I felt that. That's my person of peace. That's what you start looking for. Now, the next morning, went to Starbucks. And I was trying to talk to this boy, taking my order, and he was a nice guy. At least for a change, some of these interesting drive through people can be interesting. So I was telling that boy, I thought, see, what I'm doing is I'm looking for a person of peace everywhere I go. I'm going to do it intentionally. 
So I'm just looking, are you, are you going to be a person? So I'm looking, I say something to him. And so I did all I could. I said what I could. I threw in a seed real fast. And that boy <laughs> shut those doors to that drive through and he said, I'll, you know, he just went and lived there and got our drinks and stayed gone for like, what, a good five minutes, never opened those windows back up until he had our drink. And it was like, you know. <laughs> And even Jesus told them, they said, he said, you know what? If they refuse you, don't worry about it. Just shake it off and keep going. Because not everybody's going to accept it, and that's all right. At least I threw in some seed, and maybe somebody else is going to come by and throw some water on it. And eventually for Ricardo and Mr. Starbucks, God's going to bring an increase. Come on, will you believe with that? In Jesus' name. I'm going to close here tonight. Go ahead and come, if you will, please, Ralph. Ramp, here's where I feel like I want to close. Don't complicate this job we've been given. It is impossible in the natural, but it's, we've got God, so it's not. It's his will to do it, so he's with us and it can happen. Say it can happen. It can happen. Say it will, happen. it will happen. That's right, that's right. So how don't complicate it? It's okay to start... You know, you think about harvest and you think about nations and i got to go to Africa and i got to go to India. And that may be true for some of you. But don't start there. I mean, that's okay to think about that. I'm not rebuking you for that. You should. And many of you will go to, to many nations. I have been to many nations. So you, some of, many of you will go. But don't start there thinking there. Start with here. And start living intentionally. How do you do that? That means everywhere you go, Go there on purpose. Everywhere you work, you work there in, on purpose. If you go play basketball, you ain't just going to hang out with the boys. You got it. You got something. You're on purpose. I'm looking. I'm a harvester in this field, and I'm looking for them. Come on. Everywhere you go, I'm praying before I get there. I'm saying, God, show me the gas station I should go to. Come on. Oh, please. Lord, show me. In other words, everything I do, I'm going to live in the spirit and I'm going to live intentionally. I went to a gas station the other day by myself. I was some state somewhere and I was stopped to get gas and, and sitting on the sidewalk over there right by the door of that gas station is a boy. And I knew it when I saw him. There he is. That's my boy. So I went up to him. I don't even know what all I said. I just started saying anything I could think about saying. And uh, the more I talked to him, you know, first he's so cool, he can't hardly talk to an old lady. But the more I talked, the more I could hear the Lord telling me he's had somebody praying for him before. So I just kept going until the onions begin to, layers begin to peel. And finally, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, the boy said, my grandmother was a Christian, but she died. She read the Bible all the time. So my daddy left. I never knew him. My mother gave me to my grandmother. He said, but she read the Bible all the time. And I knew I'm on an assignment because that woman left prayers before she left the earth. My assignment's that boy. I was led to that gas station to find that boy. Everywhere you go, come on, everywhere you go, I don't care where you are, you're living intentionally. Everywhere I go, I'm here on, Eli, you're going to school on purpose. It's more than just school, you're there on purpose. You're there for an eternal purpose. No matter where God leads you, it's always there. You're led by the Spirit of God. Can you hear me, Ram? Everything we do at the ramp is going to be led by prayer. We're going to live utterly dependent upon God. We're going to pray for God to lead us to the person of peace in this city and the people of peace that we can reach. When the when chosen was young, no, we didn't have chosen when the ramp was young. I told the kids, pray for God to give us kids of influence. Because if we get a kid of influence in that high school, we only had like eight or ten kids at this point. I said, if, if we can just pray God to give us a kid of influence, they'll be, he's a leader and they'll follow him. God sent me Samuel Bentley. He'll send them if you'll pray. Some of you, some people, not so much the ones in this room, but I just thought today, and I'm grieved by this, and I want you to help me pray about it. I'm going to say this carefully. Some people have been ekbalod to the ramp. 
because the ramp's mission is gigantic. A huge harvest filled of young people. We've reached hundreds of thousands. We've reached millions by television, satellite. We're in England. We're about to be in Israel. That's another story I'll tell you another day. But it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. I haven't even told y'all. I'll tell you later. We're about to be in Israel. We've got promises concerning many cities and even other nations. This field is gigantic. And even in things as little as, as and I say little because it's not little, but even things like kids ramp, we're desperate for volunteers and helpers. Because sometimes people just see the, the glamour of the, you know, a platform with people singing and lights and sound systems and worship and all that. They think, well, that's an easy job. We can't do it unless there's people working like these camera people, these sound people, these people that's cleaning the bathrooms in the back and making sure these people have a place to use the bathroom and making sure they have uh, a place to sit that's clean and, and, and orderly. And I mean, the, the volunteer need is unreal. We can't do our job preaching unless there's laborers helping us get this job done for the Ramp School of Ministry, for the church, for every conference. We do a conference almost once a month. We can't do that unless there's people helping us. And I mean practical help. I mean just cooking and cleaning and fixing and all, just on and on we could go. We can't do it without that. We can't. It'd fall apart. We have to have laborers. And I know God has sent many people, Ekbalo, to the ramp. I mean, I look back over the last 20 years, especially the last 15, at how many, there have been hundreds of people, literally, that God Ekbalo. When I say Ekbalo, I mean He disrupted their lives. He said, you're going to sell everything you got and sell your house and move to Hamilton, Alabama. You're going to quit your job and lay down your retirement. Come on, Richard. You're going to lay it all down and y'all are moving your whole family to the ramp in Hamilton, Alabama. I know you don't know anybody there, but they need laborers. And they're down there praying for laborers and I need you to go. Not everybody he called came to come came, but a lot of them did. A lot of you are still here. And some came and they got distracted I'm going to be honest can I be honest they got distracted they got comfortable they got offended didn't look like they thought it was going to they didn't get used like they wanted to be I know I'm talking harsh right now but listen and it caused them to lose their place in the field and they're wondering I want them back. There's people in this city that moved here to be part of the ramp. And they're not here right now, but they're still living here. I want them back. I feel like going to tell them, listen, honey, I got to have you. Listen, we need you. You matter to us. I don't care what's in the way. Honey, if there, what, if there needs to be apologies, if there need, I, there's nothing worth losing your purpose over. There's no, this is urgent. We got to have you. Come on, lay the offense down. Lay the distraction down. Whatever. Is it sin? Is it compromise? There's nothing worth it. Come on. What, I'm telling you tonight, I believe God in this room right now is looking at every person that's sitting in a chair, every person in this room to night and God is saying what I've called you to do do it now time is urgent what I've called you to do do it now time is of the essence what I've called you to do Chase do it now time is of the essence come on Kevin what I've called you to do do it now Kevin do it now time is of the essence every one of you stand to your feet You matter. You matter. You matter. Dollars, you matter. Dollar family, you matter to this mission. You matter. Brianna, you matter to this mission. 
We got to have you. Durkins, you matter. McBrides, you matter. I could go by and name every, how many more could I call every person in this room by name and without leaving one of you out. Please hear my heart. I'm saying this to you individually, every person. Pray the Lord of the harvest. We got to reach people. Tonight, if you just want to say, God, I just want a fresh commitment to you. I got to get focused. I got to get a perspective shift. I got to shake off some complacency. I've got comfortable. Come on, you may tonight be in here saying, Karen, I've been fighting with normal. It's one of the biggest things you'll fight with in your whole life is normal. Why can't I be normal? Why? Why can't I be normal like other people that are Christians that seem content? Why can't I be that way? No, 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 no. Why? Because you've seen more. And you'll never be able to settle for less. Come on, God didn't call you to normal. That's why you're in this building tonight. I said, that's why you're in this building. That's why you're in the building. You didn't get called for the normal call. Come on. Those 12 disciples that heard his voice say, follow me. They didn't, they weren't called to normal. They knew. In fact, the rest of the chapter of Matthew 10, he spent the rest of the chapter telling them. First, he told them where to go. Then he told them what to do and how to do it. Then he told them what it was going to cost them. He knew it's going to cost you everything. But oh, the reward, KJ. The reward of the yes. The reward of the yes is worth it all. If you want to make a fresh